Coming up, a Fox News host and best-selling author, Eric Bowling wades into the swamp, polluting our government. Then, a former quarterback begins a second career on the airwaves. You better be on point, because they'll call you bluff if you're not. Still, he's no shock jock. We have never pre-programmed takes. We'll go for a drive with radio host Brock Heward. God used one of my vulnerabilities as a player to really be an asset in my future career. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. ISIS is on the verge of defeat in the city of Mosul in Iraq. Today, Iraqi troops captured the mosque where ISIS proclaimed its caliphate three years ago. But still, the Islamic fighters aren't giving up easily. And they're using human shields for protection. In the midst of this death and destruction, one American veteran was inspired by a Bible verse, and he risked his life to save a little girl from ISIS. Gary Lane has the story. The battle to liberate Iraq's second largest city from the clutches of ISIS is in the final stages, but the going is a bit slow. The few Islamic State fighters that remain in the city are using human shields to save themselves from the overwhelming might of Iraqi and coalition forces. One Iraqi commander says it's important his troops keep people safe. We've been advancing meter by meter these days to avoid any problems with regard to protection of civilians, he says. Now we move only 50 to 100 meters every day to protect the people here. This drone view shows the destruction in western Mosul. Blown up by ISIS, the Grand El Nuri Mosque is in ruins. Earlier this year, the U.S. Defense Department said approximately 2,000 jihadists remained in Mosul. Many have recently fled the city or been killed. Their numbers have now dwindled to just a few hundred. The offensive started last October and has brought ISIS to its knees. But it was the amazing rescue of a little girl in early June that brought one American to his knees in thankful prayer. It's the video and story that has gone viral. Pinned down by ISIS gunfire in Mosul, free Burma Rangers leader David Eubank moved in to save a young Iraqi girl. ISIS fighters had killed more than 70 people on the street the prior day, and some were still alive among the dead bodies, including the girl who was clutching the body of her dead mother. Under fire, Eubank says he ran behind a tank and started praying the whole way. He motioned to the traumatized girl, but she wouldn't come to him. He told CBN News he knew he had to run 150 yards to bring her to safety. But watching her was horrible for a whole day, trying to figure out a plan and a way to be able to help her. The girl, little girl was just holding onto her dead mother and was terrified. And so I just said, Lord, help us. And I thought, if I die, my wife and kids will understand. It's to save a little girl. Eubank says he was afraid. But one Bible verse kept coming to him and brought him encouragement. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. People say he's a hero. Eubank disagrees. I consider myself forgiven by Jesus and blessed to do something. And it was, I believe, God's power that helped us rescue that girl. Eubank's wife Karen told CBN in an email that the little girl spent that first night and next day with them. And she sent a picture of the girl sitting on a bed, watching CBN Superbook on a laptop. Gary Lane, CBN News. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful story. We overcome evil with good. And the more we understand that, that's what w w the weapons of our warfare, they're not <laughs> carnal. They're, they're, they're beyond this world. We could overcome evil with good. What a wonderful, encouraging story. In other news, here at home, the Republicans are going to try again to get a new version of their health care bill as soon as tomorrow. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell hopes to start the 4th of July holiday with a revised version of the new health care bill. Everybody around the table is interested in getting the yes. But he's still fighting an uphill battle. At least nine GOP senators oppose the bill for now, and it's unclear which parts of the draft McConnell can change to get the 50 votes needed for it to pass. His goal is to finalize the bill and get its total cost this week so they can vote on it before the end of the month. Senator John Cornyn of Texas shared his optimism. 
I expect to have the support to get it done, and yes, we will vote this week. But if Senate Republicans cannot get the bill passed, some members say it's time for other ideas, like breaking the bill into smaller pieces in order for it to pass. Well, the Department of Homeland Security laid out some new aviation security measures for international airports with direct flights to the United States. The new measures will affect thousands of flights coming into the U.S. from around the world. National security correspondent Eric Rosales shows us what passengers should expect once the new provisions are in place. Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly says his agency is raising the bar globally with new security measures to keep airline passengers and airports across the United States safe. Kelly says the changes are necessary against the constantly evolving threat of terrorism. Let me be clear, security is my number one concern. Our enemies are adaptive and we, we have to be adaptive as well. Secretary Kelly would not elaborate on any specifics of the new measure, citing security concerns. However, sources within the department tell me that there are new potential threats, such as hijackers taking over inbound U.S. planes and making bombs out of laptop batteries. Homeland Security top officials did tell CBN News international passengers can expect enhanced screening measures, especially with any electronic devices, high-tech 3D image scanners, and even bomb-sniffing dogs. 180 airlines in 105 countries around the world will be affected. Officials say 280 U.S. airports with international flights must implement the new measures, affecting more than 325,000 passengers each day. The threat is not diminished. In fact, I am concerned that we are seeing renewed interest on the part of terrorist groups to go after the aviation sector, from bombing aircraft to attacking airports on the ground, as we saw in Brussels and Istanbul. Although Homeland Security does not have jurisdiction over foreign airports, it does have authority over all planes with direct flights to the U.S. Top Homeland Security officials say any airline that does not implement the new measures when they're supposed to could face hefty penalties, such as being banned from landing their airline at any U.S. airport. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Eric. South Korea's new president is promising to stand firmly with President Trump against North Korea. President Moon Jae-in is here in Washington visiting the White House. He says the U.S. and South Korea will work together to dismantle the North's nuclear program and bring peace to the Korean Peninsula and eventually peace to Northeast Asia. Moon has faced questions about whether his desires to engage with Pyongyang could lead to tensions in his relationship with the United States. President Trump and his team of military advisors have made it clear they consider North Korea's nuclear program a major threat. And North Korea's United Nations ambassador said once again this week that his country will keep building up its nuclear arsenal. Gordon, it looks like tensions are escalating on the North Korean peninsula. As if they weren't already bad already, this is... Uh, a, a step in, in a, a, an act of belligerence, and North Korea just seems to do that. They seem to gravitate towards that. Their goal is to create ballistic missile technology that will be able to reach the United States. That's their announced goal, and uh, I, I can't imagine that. Uh, can you imagine the entire West Coast, uh, the, the major cities there being under threat of nuclear missiles. Uh, that for the United States is absolutely unacceptable. Now, I've already heard from Japan, they are already under threat from that. And uh, the short range missile capability North Korea already has. So uh, can we get to a diplomatic solution? We, we better try very hard and we need South Korea along, but more importantly, we need China to come along and put pressure on North Korea. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. A wall along the southern border with Mexico. That was one of President Trump's biggest campaign promises. Heather Sells traveled to Arizona to find out what people in Arizona think about building a wall. On his 50,000 acre ranch in southern Arizona, Jim Chilton puts out salt for his cattle and keeps an eye out for the smugglers and illegal immigrants that cross his border property. His surveillance video tells the story. I have evidence, hard evidence, of people coming through and they're mainly drug packers bringing into the United States marijuana, cocaine, 
meth, and heroin. His front porch collection offers another part of the story, abandoned carpet shoes used to erase telltale footprints by those who cross illegally. Sinaloa cartel. Chilton took CBN News on a bumpy two-hour drive for a closer look at the border on his land. Along the way, he talked of his encounters with people on the run. Turn this corner here and about 20 guys dressed in camouflage with big backpacks ran right up this way and up this hill. They were all in camouflage and the guy in front had an AK-47. It's clear to Chilton and the Border Patrol that the Sinaloa drug cartel deploys scouts on this land to guide smugglers to safety. One time, Chilton reported the discovery of four marijuana bales, well aware that the cartels could take revenge against him. Later, we parked and walked a few hundred feet to the line that has led to so many headlines and political debates. This is the international boundary. Behind me on the Mexican side, there are a number of roads and that indicates that this has become a prime spot for entry. Both illegal immigrants and drug smugglers like this area because there's only a barbed wire fence, very simple, separating the U.S. and Mexico, and also we're several hours away from the nearest Border Patrol station. That part's a sore point with Chilton. Although we spotted several agents along our journey, the shortcomings are obvious. No easy access for response to border trouble. No patrol presence along the actual border. And a barbed wire fence that may deter cattle, but certainly not people. That's why for more than a decade, Chilton has pushed for something more. It's just very obvious that you need a wall, you need a road next to it, and you need forward operation bases. Chilton and other ranchers here believe the U.S. must secure the entire southern border, all 1,989 miles of it. They believe this 20-foot high fence in nearby Nogales has simply funneled illegals towards them. Rancher Dan Bell showed us where that Nogales fence ends on his property and reverts back to barbed wire. It's as simple as for people coming through in large groups just getting a pair of wire cutters and cutting through the fence. Bell feels a little better about security than Chilton and for good reason. His ranch is closer to the Nogales Border Patrol station and... We've had uh, some road systems put in, we've had technology come in, and with the addition of those uh, and more agents in the area, uh, we have seen improvement. Bell admits, however, that gaps remain and he feels unsafe on parts of his ranch. In the areas where we're more remote, where we don't have cell phone service, um, where there's, there's very few roads uh, and they're far and, and few between, you do think about things like that and, uh, and what's, your, what's your plan going to be in case you do have a confrontation. Not everyone on the border agrees with the president's plan to build a new wall that includes many residents in Nogales and Sheriff Tony Estrada. It sounds good to, to everybody, you know, okay, we got a problem with legal immigration, with drugs, we'll just build a wall and that'll stop everything. That's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It'll help but it's not going to solve the problem. Estrada says people will always find ways to go over or under physical barriers. A wall, he says, doesn't address the real problem. You have to look at what is bringing people here. That, he says, is the drug trade and the promise of opportunity that the United States offers. In the last two decades, U.S. dollars spent on border security have kept going up. And the number of Border Patrol agents has increased 500 percent. While Estrada believes that money could be better spent, ranchers like Chilton and Bell believe it's helped to reduce the flow of immigration and drugs. Chilton argues that a wall would help lower costs like prosecuting immigrants and fighting forest fires started by drug packers. For now, he and Bell maintain an uneasy truce with those vying for control of their land. In the spirit of compassion, both maintain multiple drinking fountains to provide life-saving relief to those who need it. Still, they remain vigilant for any encounter. When those instances happen, you just, you, you go opposite ways, and that's it. And you say good morning, and you go the opposite way, and, and hope for the best. It's pretty, pretty frightening. 
Uh, but I'm a cowboy, not a wimp. I'm sticking here. Reporting on the border in Arizona, Heather Sells, CBN News. I'm a cowboy. I'm sticking here. I, I, but I couldn't imagine having that in my backyard. I, I, I'm not sure I would stick it out. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. When you see the picture of a barbed wire fence, when you go to the border and say, well, here's the border, here's the marker of it, uh, then you, you kind of go, well, perhaps we need something a little stronger. Terry? President Trump rode into office with a pledge to drain the swamp in Washington. Now, the co-host of the Fox News Specialist wants to tell him how to get it done. Eric Bowling shares his advice, and that's next. Well, American voters clearly wanted a change in Washington when they voted President Trump into office. Now that he's there, can the new president keep his promise to get rid of corruption in Washington? One author remains hopeful that he can. Take a look. We're going to drain the swamp of Washington. We're going to have fun doing it. We're all doing it together. It became the rallying cry of the 2016 election. Drain the swamp of Washington's career politicians and the corruption, cronyism, and all-around dirty dealings that some claim have cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars and have become part of business as usual in the nation's capital. Fox News host Eric Bowling says President Trump's promise to use. drain and the swamp no is no easy task themselves. because scandal and corruption have been part of the Washington scene since the very beginning of the republic. In his new book, The Swamp, Washington's murky pool of corruption, cronyism, and really strange creatures, and how Trump can drain it, Bowling lays out the ways the new president can live up to his campaign promise. Well, Eric Bowling joins us now from New York. Eric, welcome back to the 700 Club. I'm very, very proud to be back. Thank you so much for having me. You talk a lot about past political scandals in the book, going all the way back to the beginning of the republic. Uh, what does that tell us? Okay, so, so during the campaign, I was watching Donald Trump campaign or uh, meet with people in the events, and the people just really gravitated towards Drain the Swamp. They love that because it really is emblematic of what's going on in D.C. It's become a swamp that's good for the people in the swamp, the swamp creatures, but the rest of us, the voters, the taxpayers, were always the ones getting the short end of the stick. So that was resonating. So I started writing the book talking about different ways that, that D.C. Is, is a swamp. And as I'd write a story, there, someone would say, hey, do you remember this one? And I'd go further and further back in time, all the way back to the beginning of the Republic. It turns out that since America was born, since the founding fathers, there have been corrupt capitalists and cronyisms going on in D.C. since the very beginning, even before D.C. was the capital. But interestingly, while I'm doing research for the book, I'm looking for a great picture for the book. And I'm Googling around the swamp and I'm getting all these old movies and things like the swamp thing. But then I accidentally typed in DC and swamp in the same Google search and a picture comes up from the National Archives of the Capitol building in the mid 1860s being built on a literal swamp. I mean, there's a picture of the dome's not even on top yet. And there's a swamp, it's, it's among swamp land with an old burnt out canoe. And it was built on a literal swamp. And I said, wow, this is a sign from God that this is the right project at the right time. And I'm gonna tell you, what they did is unbelievable. They drained the literal swamp to build the Capitol building, but by doing that, they created Washington, D.C., the metaphorical swamp that they never got around to draining. Yeah, that's how they convinced Maryland and Virginia to give up the land for it. <laughs> they didn't think it was worth anything. It's amazing <laughs> how many stories of backdoor dealings, trading, elected officials buying pieces of land in areas that weren't even America yet, only to push to have those part, pieces of land in those territories become part of America to, to, to make themselves and their families rich, always at the expense of Americans. It's, it's unbelievable how much material I had for the book. I, I could probably write three or four books just on what goes on in the swamp. Uh, any of the stories really stick out for you? So that's the, the, the whole, so I have all these stories and I'm writing, but I wanted to really open the book with something compelling, a story everyone knew, but maybe didn't know all the details surrounding. So I started with Ted, Ken Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, when he, uh, you know, <laughs> he was having a party with five of his married friends. So the six of the guys are there with 
six very young single women having a, a cocktail party. They're drinking. They Ted Kennedy peels off with Mary Jo Kopechny. Now, we know the story of Chappaquiddick and what happens. He drives into the water. The car gets flooded. He's a good swimmer. He swims to the bank. But what people may not realize is that Ted Kennedy sat on the side of that water bank for a good period of time contemplating, ready for this, his political future. Mary Jo Kopechny is in that car still, and he's a good swimmer, yet he contemplates, what is this effect going to be on his political future? He goes back, to, instead of, there were, there were cottages all the way back to the party. He didn't knock on one single door. Some of them had lights on. He goes back to the party, has another cocktail with his friends, six guys and five girls now. No one says anything about Mary Jo. Kennedy gets back, goes back to his own hotel, goes to bed and complains to the hotel manager that there's too much noise in the lobby, that the party in the lobby needs to quiet down because he's trying to sleep. The next morning, the friends from the party the night before show up at Kennedy's hotel room and say, you got to go to the police. And he says, I, I know I do. It's just I, I, I'm getting around to it. He calls the police. And here's the kicker. They get Mary Jo Kopechny's body out of, out of the water. Turns out that she had lived for hours after that car went into the water, couldn't get herself out, and subsequently suffocated instead of drowning. And that is what the political swamp is all about. And ready for this? Kennedy gets elected several times after that. Well, we hear a lot about lobbyists for special interest groups. Are lobbyists a big part of the problem? That was one of the most important sections of the book. So I, 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 there are chapters on, you know, backroom dealings and whatnot, and there's sections on fighting on the House floor and the Senate and whatnot. And there's a section on Aaron Burr and his duel with Hamilton that actually killed him. Um, but the section I found mo most compelling personally was the lobbying. The lobbyist is it's it's really what creates the swamp and the swamp creatures. So special interest groups and corporations put up all this money, they drop it into the laps of these lobbyists who then have spent the last you know, year, five years, 10 years, shaking hands, getting to know, whining and dining politicians and their assistants so that they get access to the influential politicians. It greases the wheel so that the corporation or special interest group gets exactly what they want. The lobbyist gets the money, they get a lot of the money, and the congressman or senator get campaign contributions. It's a vicious cycle, it's a closed loop that we never get to see. Now, I'll tell you what I did. I sat down with Jack Abramoff. By the way, this is a bipartisan book. I, I point the finger at both Republicans and Democrats in this. If you're, if you're a swamp creature, you're going to be in my target. Jack Abramoff was a Republican who was very close to the Bush administration. He actually knew people in the Department of the Interior. And why that matters is this. Jack also was taking money from Native American groups so that these groups could put casinos on federal lands. And so there were these dealings that were going on. Jack was skimming off money for himself illegally, put money into his own pocket. Native Americans got their casinos. Lawmakers got their campaign contributions. Jack put money in his pocket, but he got caught going a little bit too far, crossing the legal line. Most of this stuff is legal, by the way, which is even more crazy. But he went a little bit too far, got caught, spent four years in jail. And I, I really wanted to pick his brain as to how do you fix some of these, these issues that are creating such a murky, deep swamp. Well, uh, what, what are the solutions? I mean, do you have any suggestions for President Trump on how to drain the swamp? Well, OK, so on that area, Jack said Trump is doing the exact right thing by announcing that if you're going to come to work for the Trump administration, that's fine. But once you leave, you can't become a lobbyist for five years. And I think that's very, very important because Jack said what happens is there'll be people, good, intelligent, smart, wise people who will come work for an admi the administration or any administration, get to know everyone, get business cards, make relationships, work a year or two, leave, go right to K Street, which is the lobbying street in, in D.C., get these high paying, powerful jobs, and then just make money off the, the uh, relationships that he or she developed while at the administration, basically sucking off the administration and the taxpayer just to get lining his own pockets. So he says, give it a five-year ban. Jack went so far as to say, maybe it should be never. If you work for an administration, you can never be a lobbyist. But that's one of the, the recommendations in the book is take the advice of a guy who went to jail for doing it wrong. Put the, adhere to the campaign promise of a five-year lobbying ban once you leave the administration. I also, I know President Trump very well. I know him personally. I've told him this personally. I put it in the book. 
I think he needs to continue the social media. I think he needs to continue to tweet and Facebook because I know a lot of people on my friends, even friends on the right, will tell me, why are you telling him this? This is bad, bad uh, advice. I think it's great advice. The media is so biased against him. We just saw what happened with CNN. They got caught, but they got caught on one instance. Meanwhile, there's thousands upon thousands. The vast majority of the media is left-leaning and just want to tack, take down Donald Trump at any cost, even if the story is not real. They'll pu publish fake news, and, and CNN did. The point is this. Since the media is so biased against Donald Trump, you're never going to get a fair and balanced view of what's going on in D.C. When Donald Trump tweets to 110 million people, far bigger audience than the media is combined, mainstream media combined, he's showing you what's going on inside his mind. Now, you may be a bit uncomfortable with it, but for me, I want to know what the most powerful man on the planet has going through his mind every single morning when he gets up. I think it's a great idea, and I hope he doesn't stop doing it. I don't think he will either, but I hope he doesn't stop. Uh, what's the biggest takeaway you'd like people to get from the book? that it really is a swamp, that they really are a closed group. We, the taxpayer and voters, really are getting the short end of the stick, and it has to stop. And the only way to stop it is to shine a light on what goes on. You, you flip the light on the cockroaches and they scatter, but you keep the lights on them. And I think the book, by the way, Donald Trump retweeted the book uh, on Tuesday, the day we launched. Matt Drudge put it up on his homepage the day we launched. The book, it shot right up to number two on Amazon. It's the right book at the right time because we're shining the light on the cockroaches. Let's just keep the lights on. There's a rumor going around you may run for office that you may want to move to the swamp. Is that is there any truth to it? <laughs> I, I, if I, there, it's not. It's more than a rumor. It was. It was based on uh, two interviews I gave. One for the Star Ledger and New Jersey newspaper, and then Politico picked it up and they said they they they, they blew it up big. The way it, it started was the reporter asked me what I want, what, you know, what's next for, you know, I used to play professional baseball, I do the TV thing, the books are going great. They said, what's next? And I said, I definitely, definitely, definitely want to get into politics at some point, elected office, most likely the Senate. And the reporter said, where? And I said, well, let's put it this way, S the South. The reason why I said that, there are a couple of senators. Now, I'm not going to say what area of the South. I really, I, I just don't want to at this point. There are a couple of Republican senators who I think have done conservatives a disservice. They'll, they ran on the GOP ticket. They ran on the GOP platform. They got to D.C., and all they've done is made the swamp bigger, deeper, and murkier. They pre pretended to be uh, conservatives, and they're not. They're, they're establishment Republicans who are just for bigger, bigger government, more taxes, more redistribution of wealth. So there are a couple of senators that, that in, in states that I have my eye on that I think I could replace as a Republican and really bring some true conservatism to, to, to the Senate. Well, good luck to you, though, on that. Uh, I said 12 years ago, you left out in your history that you were one of the biggest natural gas traders on the planet. And I've just got to thank you. Twelve years ago, you made a, uh, a, a real strong recommendation on a television show. I normally don't take stock recommendations on TV shows, <laughs> but you did. Uh, at that point in time, I didn't have a lot of money, and my daughter was facing surgery up at the uh, special surgery in New York, and I didn't have the money to pay for her to go there. I took your tip because it was so from your heart, and I said, he's got to know what he's talking about. And I made a, enough money in just a month to be able to pay for my daughter's surgery. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, my uh, gosh. That was something that, that, else. God bless. That, yeah. is, that yeah. is just a, an amazing you, story. I had no you, idea. Wow. You, you've got a real well, strong connection with me and with my daughter. So thank you, Eric, and thank you for well, all you know, that you're Well, you know, I go to St. Patrick's every single... Every single day of the week, I go light some candles. I'll keep, keep you and the whole audience in my prayers today as well. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for being with us. The book, it's called The Thanks Swamp, and it's available where, wherever books are sold. Terry? Fascinating. <clears throat> Get my copy. <laughs> well, still ahead, pay a visit to a hard-working handyman who was using a welding machine nicknamed Electric Mayhem. There are many things I need, like gloves and work boots, but I don't have enough money for them. Watch as he gets hope for today and for generations to come after this.
And welcome back to the 700 Club. Younger evangelical Christians are more likely to support same-sex marriage than their older counterparts. 47% of Generation X and Millennial Evangelicals, those born after 1964, favor same-sex marriage, compared to 26% of baby boomers and older evangelicals who were born between 1928 and 1964. That is according to a new study from the Pew Research Center. Young evangelicals are finding new ways to interpret the Bible to support their views on gay marriage. Preschoolers at a Christian school in Sweden are forbidden from praying before meals, saying amen, or even talking about the Bible. According to This Is England, supervisors from the school district say, taking part in these acts of faith violates a law called the Education Act, even if they're done at a Christian school. The law says any educational content that contains confessional elements is inappropriate. So instead of thanking God before meals, the preschoolers are instructed to thank the sun and the rain. Now you can find out more about both of these stories and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, it's cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Well, years ago, M. Buta was a teen living on the streets. And then he moved into a CBN-sponsored children's home. Now he volunteers at that same children's shelter. So when reporter Dan Rainey found out that Mbuta needed help with his small business, we were more than willing to lend a hand. I'm Dan Rainey, and I travel the world, bringing back stories of the good CBN does in people's lives. I have a master's in anthropology, and I love meeting new people and learning about different cultures. I've battled among the Maasai, seen earthquake aftermath in Haiti, and walked the shepherd's fields of the Holy Land. Now, I want to spend at least 24 hours with some of the families we help. I want to work with them, eat with them, and understand firsthand what they go through, struggling to survive, one day at a time. On the outskirts of Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I visited a children's home that's supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. That's where I met Mbuta, a young man who is one of the first orphans that grew up there. Mbuta now earns a living as a handyman and welder. Recently, he volunteered weeks of his time to build all the doors and windows for the school at the children's home. I wanted to find out more about Mbuta's life, so I asked him to show me where he lives. He led me down through the neighborhood, took me to a small apartment building where he rents a single room. He offered me a cold drink, and we talked. When I was a small boy, both of my parents died. When I was 14, I came to the children's home and life was very good. I had enough food, good clothes, and I was able to go to school and church. As the heat of the day passed, Mbuta told me it was time to get to work. I was shocked when I saw his local welder. Bare wires, bad connections, and 210 volts of danger. I nicknamed his homemade welder Electric Mayhem. The homemade welder is all that I can afford. It works most of the time, but it's not very powerful, and it overheats and has to be repaired all the time. I rent my grinder and some other equipment. There are many things I need, like gloves and work boots, but I don't have enough money for them. Mbuta said he's saving every penny he can because he wants to get married. His fiance, Yuyu, is an apprentice at her aunt's dress shop, right across the street from Mbuta's welding yard. When I saw her, it was love at first sight. She is very pretty. But what I like most is that she's very kind and a good Christian girl. I know we will have a good life together. Mbuta is not like other boys. He's a follower of Christ and he treats me with respect. He's a hard worker. He'll be a good husband. We worked on a door together that day. His rented grinder wasn't working, so he cut all the pieces by hand. Lunch was simple, a few pieces of bread and some soda. While we ate, he told me more about how he grew up. When I was a small boy, both of my parents died, and I went to live with my uncle. He had many wives and children, 
and couldn't take care of me. I had nothing. He ran away to find a better life, but wound up living in the street. I had no home and I slept on the ground. It was a very unhappy time. One day, someone told him about the new children's home that had opened just outside the city. When I was 14, I came to the children's home and life was very good. I had enough food, good clothes, and I was able to go to school and church. After lunch, we got back to the project. Mbuta had the grinder working again, so things were a little easier. But I still wanted to do something about electric mayhem. So a few days later, I went into the city. Mbuta is the perfect person to help. He's focused, he's a hard worker, and he genuinely cares about people. So I know that with just a little hand up, he's not going to stop at building a better life for himself and you. you. He's going to continue to help others. And that means that their family will be better off for generations, and so will the community around them. Back at Mbuta's welding yard, he had no idea what was about to happen. Check it out. <laughs> Something for you to start your new life with, with you, you. And we had one last surprise for him to present to Yuyu, a sewing machine of her very own. With these blessings, I know Yuyu and I have a great future ahead of us. I can't thank you enough, and I pray God will bless you more. What a wonderful story. That's what 700 Club members do. We don't just give handouts. We give hand ups so that people can have a hope and a future can be able to make a living on their own and go through life confident that, that, that there's a God who loves them, who wants to provide for their every need. If you're not a member, we invite you to join with us. It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in today's world. If you're already a member of the 700 Club, I encourage you, could you consider increasing? There's so many opportunities available to CBN today. Uh, the number of doors that are open for us to preach the gospel through television, uh, to help people in very tangible ways. So if you're a 700 Club member, consider going to 700 Club Gold. That's $40 a month. There's also a 1,000 Club, and that's $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. When you call and join, I've got something for you. It's a wonderful DVD on miracles. Uh, they're real-life testimonies of people who have experienced God's miraculous power. And then my father comes in with a teaching, an interview with Scott Ross, where he shares the secrets to miracles, the secrets that he's li lived out for over 55 years in ministry, how God has led him to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, how to get miracles in your life. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join, so call us, one 800 Seven hundred seven thousand. Terry? Well, still ahead, she's a Facebook star who just wants to tell the world about her deliverance. God supernaturally allowed me to see with as a purity. He's the only one that could set you free. See how she was set free after literally having her breath taken away when we come back. Every day, Sophia Ruffin breaks out her smartphone and busts political correctness. That's because Sophia has done something the social justice warriors say cannot be done. She's been delivered from a lesbian lifestyle. Give me, give me, give me some love. Let's Sophia Ruffin hosts a daily live show on Facebook where thousands of viewers listen to her candidly share her story of how she was delivered from homosexuality. Many people say, once gay, always gay, or they feel you can be delivered from everything but homosexuality. People can be free from homosexuality. God is a deliverer. Sophia's popularity as a minister of the gospel 
is a far cry from her lonely days growing up in Chicago. Sophia's mom worked long hours, and her dad often was at home. I was missing some of that affection, needing that, those hugs and that embrace. In third grade, she developed a crush on a female teacher who affirmed her and encouraged her. She called me pretty. Come here, pretty girl. She started doing my hair. I would feel different. I couldn't share with anybody because I knew that it wasn't right. I knew the girls are supposed to like boys. Sophia says early on she preferred hanging out with boys and playing basketball with them. She began to be bullied, and Sophia resorted to the only thing she knew how to do, fight. When people would say, name, call me Dyke, tomboy, or butch, I would just outright fight them. Then when Sophia was 10, something happened that only added to her confusion. She was molested, and the abuse lasted for four years. She never told anyone about it. And I just felt like, why me? Then I really despised God, because not only did I feel like I'm gay, I'm born gay, now I'm, you know, molested and violated. By now, Sophia's basketball skills were so advanced that when she went to high school, she made the varsity girls basketball team. And on the varsity team, we had some young ladies that was openly in the homosexual lifestyle. And I felt like, wow, I finally found people that are like me and they okay with it. Sophia began wearing baggy clothes and eventually threw away anything that connected her to feminine identity. I was ready to move into and be who I felt I was born to be, and I was a man. In her junior year, Sophia started having relationships with other girls. She went to college on a basketball scholarship where she fully embraced lesbianism and her identity as a man. By this time, her mother Doris knew. My heart was broken. It was broken to pieces. Sophia lived as a lesbian for 10 years. Her mom and many others prayed for her. I would say, look God, this is your child. You only known it to me. She belongs to you. So you gonna have to do what's need to be done. I didn't get to a low point where I was gonna give up on her. Sophia had a Christian friend named Devin who was persistent in inviting her to church. Finally, she accepted her invitation. While there, something strange happened. And I kept saying, I can't breathe. I start hyperventilating and I was holding their hands just like, I can't breathe, help. I was screaming for help. And I remember her tapping her chest and saying, Devin, I can't breathe. And at that moment, I knew like, God, you're now taking her breath away, which means for me that when God comes and take her breath away, that means he's breathing in new life. It was like God said, now I got my daughter. Sophia says she heard God telling her to go to the front of the church. And the whole time I'm talking back to him, I said, but please, because if you let me down and you don't protect me like you said you are, this is it. I'll never do this again. It won't be a second shot. And God kept saying, trust me with your life. I got you. I wasn't just going to the altar to say the sinner's prayer. I was going to give my whole life to the God that apprehended me in the service with a power that was greater than me. When Sophia reached the front, the pastor, Apostle Tim Brinson, began to pray with her. I saw a person that was asking Father God, I want to change, but will you help me? Is this real? And I cried out and I lifted my hands and I said I was sorry. And it wasn't a, it was a genuine sorry. I was sorry that I misunderstood who he was. I was sorry that I, I had such a anger towards him. And I was really sorry for everything that I had done. And when I accepted Christ as my personal savior, it wasn't me asking God to come into my life just as a cliche. Me asking was him to be Father, Lord, God of my life, and I accepted him for real. Sophia says over the next four years, God began a transformation in her heart and mind to make her into the woman he created her to be. On Mother's Day, Sophia surprised her mom 
and came to church dressed like a lady. And I looked, so, oh, she is so beautiful. And she opened her arms really wide. And I got up and I ran to my mom. And the embrace, the embrace that she gave me, I forgot about all the years that I didn't get it. She held me and she says, Sophia, my baby, you back. You look so pretty. I love you. I miss you. My baby is back. Thank God, thank you for allowing her to live, to see that her prayers, her love, her believing in me and trusting that you was not in vain. I got my identity back. God supernaturally allowed me to see with as a purity and holiness. He delivered the whole, the whole being was delivered. Three! As a minister and author of four books, Sophia helps to lead others out of the homosexual lifestyle and find healing and freedom in Jesus Christ. So hold on to his word and just believe, even if you got to limp to him, limp your way, crawl your way, get to him. He's the only one that can set you free. He is the only one who can set you free. And in his word, God clearly tells us who we are created to be. He says, you are made in the image and likeness of God. No mistakes. God created you to be all that he intended you to be, hope, a purpose, a future. All of those things are his promises for you. And then there's the enemy of God, and his desire is to hurt the heart of God as much as he can. How do you think he most does that? By besmirching that image so that you yourself don't understand what you were created to be. Don't see the God who loves you with an everlasting love. So that you compromise, you make choices, you turn around, you run in the opposite direction, and you become something you were not created to be but there's freedom. That's the message that Sophia brings with her story. Doesn't matter how far you've gone or what you've done, your heavenly Father created you in the image and likeness of himself. And he will wait, he will watch for you to come. So I just reiterate what Sophia said to you. If you've got to get down on your knees, on your belly and crawl back to him because of your desperation, crawl back. His arms are open, the invitation always there for you. You see, God loves you with an everlasting love and the world would tell you that that's different, that he's not there, that he's not real. The world will put polish over every choice you make, every lifestyle you choose to engage in. But there's something more. Don't miss it in your heart of hearts. Hear the voice of God calling you back to what you were created to be. If you need to pray with somebody today, our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Be set free. The Bible says that the one the sun sets free is free indeed. We've got a packet called A New Day. It's free to you. Ask for it when you call. We want to leave you today with these words from 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.